Hey, how are you going? Welcome to Extra Healthish. This is the big sister podcast to Healthish. Both podcasts are from Body and Soul, and we've designed them to give you that little extra oomph in your day for your mind, body, and soul. Today, you're going to hear from a Professor Dr. Cassandra Serkey. She's the principal investigator of the Women's Healthy Aging Project, the longest ongoing study of women's health in Australia. She's got a book out. It's got all the info in it from her research. It's called Secrets of Women's Healthy Aging. Now, I asked her to come well back on today. She has been on before because there was something that came up in her research and I'm seeing a lot more studies out there about it. In fact, some experts are calling it an epidemic. It is a loneliness. And at this time of year, it can rear its head. So I wanted Dr. Cassandra to come on and tell you, well, share her learnings on what the antidote to loneliness is. Dr. Cassandra, thank you so much for coming on Extra Healthyish. Now, I know I've asked you this before, but, you know, we need to do it again. How do you stay extra healthyish in your life? I think the number one thing you can do is think about your health each and every day. We often don't have it on our very long to-do list, which we don't even get to the end of, <laughs> and we should be putting that number one. What am I going to do for my health today? And so what have you done or are you going to do for your health today? Oh, well, you know, I must say having, uh, you know, I wrote the book because these are the tenants I kind of live by now. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, um, each of the chapters covers the things you really should be doing and focusing on. And so, you know, moving every day, making sure you're eating a healthy, healthy foods, making sure that you don't let stress convert into distress yes. and making sure you're connected. Yeah. That is really important as well as remembering that human beings are the most remarkably adaptable beings on earth. And look, certainly in the last two years, we've uh, yeah. <laughs> we've really put that to the test. We've really put that to the test. Can we? Can we actually cope with all that's going on? And, you know, we, we can. Um, and so just remembering that because, you know, life's not always easy and just remembering how adaptable a species we are. So even when things get tough, um, you know, stick in there and, and you'll do great. Now, one thing you just raised before, connection, we're talking about that today. What did your study show about, well, Australian women, sorry, blokes, it's all about women today. Um, What did it show about women and connection and how we connect? Well, really, we connect in all sorts of different ways. There's no one size fits all. And I'll also say this applies for men and women. So they've done research showing that men who are lonely are also more likely to get diseases. They also have higher rates of stress hormones in their blood and they also have been shown to have depressed immune systems. So that means they're more likely to get infections, which in the COVID time, I suppose, is very important. Yes. Um, so, you know, this is true for men and women that loneliness is not conducive to good health. Right. And what do you think, What is? what are you seeing, I suppose, out there in the impact that COVID has had on our connections. I mean, obviously it has made it worse because we haven't been able to connect face to face, but are we, where, where is it going to leave us and, and what can we do, I suppose, in the future? So I think what's important to remember is that being connected to your community and to your social groups is what's important. And, you know, we used to not have mobile phones. I know a lot of young people, I don't know how they'd fathom that. (laughs) But, you know, in the old days, you'd walk over to your neighbour and you'd have a chat. And now we can pick up the telephone and now we can Zoom internationally. So, you know, I think... Um, Whilst it has been incredibly difficult and change is not easy for any being on the planet, if you change the environment for some animals, flora, fauna, anything on earth, if you change the environment dramatically and quickly, often things die. They actually cannot survive through it. Human beings are unbelievably adaptable. Even with rapid changes to environment, human beings actually manage to adapt. That's one of our greatest strengths. Um, Also, potentially a bit of a weakness because we tend to over-adapt our environments at times. (laughs) (laughs) But nevertheless, you know, we do adapt really well. So what we've seen is, you're absolutely right, the COVID epidemic has caused enormous disruption to our normal lines of connection and communication. We've also seen you know, uh, elbow bumps and uh, foot yes, taps yes. become the new handshake. <laughs> <Who knew? laughs> you know, so we are adapting and as much as it was a bit funny to begin with, you know, we are adapting and still getting the positive gains 
from those connections. Although we lament loss, as, as all do, um, we actually can adapt. And as long as we feel connected to our community, that's what's important. So whatever does that for you is what's important. And we may have to adapt in future not to do some of the things that traditionally we did. Yeah, that's a great point, actually, because I think, you know, within your community, it could be going and getting a local, you know, going up to your local coffee shop and getting a coffee, or it could be going down the park and meeting some, you know, if you've got kids, other, other, you know, mums down there. It's, you know, sometimes it's those little things that just kind of pep you up, isn't it, in your community throughout the day? Oh, totally. And look, Felicity, I think I should mention just in terms of healthy ageing, hearing loss is something that is actually quite prevalent as we get older. Right. When someone's wearing a mask and talking to you, I don't know about you, but sometimes, (laughs) you know, my hearing, I believe, is A-OK, yet I cannot understand sometimes when people are speaking through a mask. So we also have to realise that sometimes people with hearing loss they actually become socially disconnected because they can't hear everything that's going on. And, you know, communication, we're very verbal in our communications. So I think, you know, remembering to optimise and get hearing tested and get it augmented, it's actually really important. A lot of people, you know, put off getting that hearing aid and so on. But, you know, studies have actually shown that people who um, can't hear very well, they're actually more likely to get dementia. And there's a big debate going on as to whether it's, you know, one of the early signs and symptoms symptoms of dementia or whether in fact they're not using their brain as much because they're not you know um, decoding as much data because they can't hear what's going on around them. We'll be back after this short break with more from Dr Cassandra. What about, I mean, as humans, why are we better together? Oh, well, look, you know, um, now we've got to ask an anthropologist. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So uh, really it's because this is how we've evolved as a species. So we didn't evolve um, on our own. Um, We evolved um, in groups, in community groups. And that is how we took over the planet, to be honest. Let's be honest. You and I can speak honestly. (laughs) Uh, But we took over the planet by forming community groups. So... um, There were various uh, human beings across history through evolution. You know, they dug up fossils. They've seen the tools used. They've seen where people lived in communities, where people didn't. And the people who were living in communities were the ones that actually took over the earth. Yeah. And being together means whilst human beings are not the fastest thing on the planet, um, just like the wolves can uh, in a pack coordinate and surround you. Yeah. Um, even though we might not be the fastest, we can, like pack wolves, surround um, prey um, or even a threat and therefore win, even though we're not the fastest, we're not the strongest. Then you've got, of course, our mental capabilities which have allowed us to build and engineer and invent. And again, there's not one Galileo or one, (laughs) there's not one person, Da Vinci, who invented everything. Yeah. You know, everyone invented a little bit and the light came from Benjamin Franklin and the, you know, and by everyone contributing together and sharing that knowledge, we have just, you know, gone light years. Um, In what, two, three hundred years, we've kind of entirely changed the way we live. So we are fundamentally at an evolutionary level, a species that's connected. And look, if you look at our closest cousins, um, you know, monkeys, um, uh, really, they are also very, very socially engaged species. So they live in groups too. And so, you know, even if we look at thousands of years prior to human development, um, that social element is there and it's there in so many animal species. It really is. Yeah, and I think even, you know, just you talking there just made me think even of since COVID hit, we have worked better together even globally, haven't we? Because we've all kind of shared knowledge about vaccines and where we're at with um, COVID and it's been a lovely display of working better together on all fronts. Well, look, I think human beings together can always achieve more. It's just convincing. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Everyone to get on the same page. To do it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, talk me, talk me through about gender. I mean, we're seeing stats out there about women being, you know, more uh, suffering loneliness more than men. Does gender have a role in all this? Look, it's just so complicated and uh, gender does have a role. And so the thing to remember is there's also gender and there's also sex. So there's a sex role, there's a gender role. At the end of the day, you've got overlapping um, chromosomal gene differences, which are hormonal differences, but also probably more so when we're talking about loneliness, you also have cultural differences. 
Yeah, good point. And that's where kind of gender comes in. And then, of course, you've got cultural changes. So, you know, these things are different in different countries. So in some countries, you know, family groups live together. In our Western countries, we tend not to, so that actually augments loneliness. In some other cultures where families live together, older people have a very significant role within the family unit. So this idea of purpose and connection is already there. And, um, you know, you look at the people who are living oldest on the planet, like the Japanese, or, you know, that they, they have that connection to community and connection to family. Um, and in some other cultures, people are isolated. And, you know, look at COVID, our aged care system and services that puts um, older people in facilities. Um, that, when COVID hit, became a dramatic revelation of how isolated yeah, people absolutely. can get very quickly yeah. in those kind of situations. Actually, so look, you talk sorry. about, I was just going to ask you about the attitude. I mean, you talk in your book about the attitude to ageing being tied with life satisfaction. Why is attitude important throughout life? And I suppose when you get, you know, when we're put into aged care, which I'm, I'm not loving, by the way, I want to go and live in Italy or Greece by then and, and <laughs> live with my kids. <laughs> Look, I think um, attitude to ageing is important for ageing and attitude to life is important for life. So I think attitude is important throughout life. And what we really learnt from these women, um, so it's, it's published in the research that as people get older, they get more disease, and as they get more disease, they get um, lower mood. So um, reducing quality of life, if you have diseases that cause you pain, you're more likely to um, have lowered mood and so on. So when we looked across 30 years, and look, very few studies actually have data across 30 years prospectively, which means as you collect it as people are doing it, um, whereas often um, people might look retrospectively at what people said and then what they have now. We've actually looked prospectively, so as people have been going. Um, so it's rare to have 30 years. And looking at people over 30 years, you wouldn't believe it. We were expecting to have lower and lower mood because they had loss, they lost partners, yeah. um, they had, you know, difficulties, they had morbidities. Maybe they were caring for loved ones who had morbidities, sorry, sickness. Yeah. Um, so they had all of these things we know lowers mood. So we were expecting as time went on, they would get um, more likely to be depressed. However, when we looked at the people who'd been in our study every year for all of 30 years and uh, looked at their depression scores on a special scale that judges your likelihood of being depressed, we found that the older they were, the less likely they were to be depressed. Oh, so wow. we thought, hang on, what's going on? That's that's bucking the trend of what yeah. everyone says. Yeah. <laughs> and so we had to drill down into the data. And what we saw was their negative mood, um, so those uh, feeling bad about things, was absolutely blipping, you know, when they lost their partner, when they had a divorce, when they lost a child, when they had um, an illness or disease that limited their function. Absolutely that negative mood went up as you would expect it to do. However... Over time, they got much better at mitigating that negative blip with a positive mood. Ah, oh, right. So they actually, their positive mood scores were going up. So they were actually able to better cope with what life threw at them. And therefore, overall, they were actually, as a group, less likely to be depressed when they were older than when they were in midlife. Oh, gives us hope, doesn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. And that's why that's why I think attitude is important. And look, they have shown that with positive attitude, you can actually change that stress hormone profile in your blood. And again, as I said, there's a cascade there. When the body gets stressed, you can depress your immune system, you can disrupt your sleep, and then that leads to other bad things. Yeah. So, you know, having that um, positive mood is important and it does relate to health. But, you know, we don't just go and plug that in or, or grab it from somewhere. That's actually also connected to our social community and connection. Right, yeah. Actually, we, we draw a lot of our support from our community and that gives us that positive balance, that support to counterbalance some of the negative things that we have to deal with in life. The village, long live the village. That's what we need. <laughs> we need more of the village. Lastly, you say in your book, I love this cliche, the little things that count. Well, you say they really do count. What's this all about? Well, look, one of the things I should say is, you know, in this study of more than 400 women, there was nobody there who, you know, made world peace, right? Yeah. <laughs> so these, these are not, don't think, oh my goodness, I have to, you know, be Gandhi and then I will have purpose. Um, these are people who were just normal people doing normal things. And it was unbelievable that those who were doing really well 
they were simply part of a volunteer group. The people doing really well, what were they doing? They were part of an art group. You know, I actually have an anecdote from, from some of the people in the study and they were saying that throughout their life they were actually probably always part of communities, but it was the husband's work community, the children's school community, and finally um, when they retired they actually, you know, chose their own art group and it's the first time they've chosen their community and they're loving it. So, you know, it's little things. It's little things that give us purpose and meaning and that social connection. I love that. Let's leave it there. Thank you so much for coming on Extra Healthy-ish, Dr. Cassandra. My pleasure, Felicity, my pleasure. I hope this gave you some really valuable advice and tips on how to deepen your connection, your relationships with the people around you. If you are interested in more from Dr. Cassandra Serkey, grab her book. It's called Secrets of Women's Healthy Aging. If you want more from us at A Body and Soul, you can download other episodes of Extra Healthy-ish. We release those Monday to Thursday or Healthy-ish, our short podcast. We release episodes of that Monday to Friday. Jump online at bodyandsoul.com.au or follow us on Instagram or Facebook. Thanks again for listening as always. And if you have a moment, we'd be so grateful if you could rate, review or subscribe to this podcast. And until tomorrow, stay extra healthy-ish.